Hey everyone, today we are going to talk about a very interesting debugging story that is coming out of Uber. Some time ago, Uber's engineers saw that Go's debugging is sometimes not working on Apple Silicon laptops. So they decided to go deep into it and what they found out would help us learn a little bit about computer architectures. It would help us a little bit to learn about linkers. So let's get on with it. Look at the problem here. Here's interactive debugging for some code on ARM64, the architecture that Apple Silicon uses, and MD64, the more widely used architecture used by processors like Intel. It's the same as x86-64. You will see the problem. You see in ARM, the source file information, which is required for debugging, is not present. Now we need to figure out why this source file information is not there. Why is it not appearing here? To do that, first we have to understand how Go actually works. We have to understand how Go compiles your code and takes it and makes it into a executable file. All right, when you write your Go code in a .go file, that code is taken by the compiler and converted into a platform independent object file, which means that object file would be same on ARM64 and AMD64. It would be same on all architectures. Today we don't really need to understand exactly how the object file looks or what is the exact structure of the object file. But we need to understand some parts of it. See, the object file contains assembly-like instructions compiled from your program. It also contains the details of each symbol. Everything that you have declared in your Go file is a symbol. So each type you have declared, each function that you have declared, each global variable that you have declared, everything is a symbol. Now look at this simple main.go code. It has a main function and we are calling fmt.println from it. Now, during the compilation, the compiler actually does not know where the fmt.println functions code would be. But it generates an object file from the main.go file, which I have shown below. So this is the actual object file code that you can see. Now, you will notice that it has a call instruction. And the call instruction requires the address of the function the processor needs to go to and execute it. But you see, the call instruction's address is just zero. What does it mean? You will also see that it says fmt.println. So it knows the compiled object file knows which symbol name to go to. It knows that it needs to go to fmt.println. So it knows which symbol name to go to. But it does not know which address to go to. Here comes the job of the linker. Now the source file would generate a object file. The main.go file would generate an object file. The print.go file, which is the part of the standard library in Go, um, will generate an object file too. Now it contains the fmt.println function. These object files generated from the source files would then be combined and linked into an executable that you need to run. So we will see how the linker goes to the object file from main.go and then links or finds the fmt.println function and puts the address um, in that code that is generated by the compiler. But how does this combination, this linking actually happen? You see the object file of our main function would contain something called relocations, which would tell the linker which addresses it needs to find. So there would be a relocation for fmt.println2. So it would tell the linker, hey, find the address for this function and put it somewhere. So there would be relocation for fmt.println2, the function that we need to call. When the linker reads this relocation, it would go and find the address of fmd.println. The relocation would also contain the offset or the location of the instruction where this address needs to be put. So we saw that zero was there. It will contain the offset so that the linker can go ahead and find the address and put it in the right instruction, put it in the right location. So the linker would go and find the address, find our call instruction and replace the zero with the real address. And in the executable, only the real address would be written, not the zero that we had in our object file. Okay, now you see when we use Go's obj-dump tool to read an object file, it also contains the source file information. Like it contains a mapping of which instruction comes from which line of the source file, of the main.go file. This information is required when debugging. This was not working for Uber somehow in the final executable. But how is this information stored? With each symbol in the object file, there are associated aux sims or auxiliary symbols which contains the source file information. So with the symbol for function main, it would also store the source file information of which instruction corresponds to which line in the code. When the linker creates the executable file, it 
merges all the aux symbol information from all the object files and puts it into the executable file. The format in which this information is stored is called dwarf. And as you saw, it is embedded inside the object file. So the dwarf information is inside the object files itself. And all the dwarf info from all the object files is collected and merged by the linker. Now that we know the fundamentals, let's go back to the issue that Uber had. Since the debugging was working for MD64 and not for ARM64, they compared the object dump of the executables for both the platforms. They found that the call instruction in AMD64 and ARM64 are a little bit different. They are trying to call the fx.new function here, which is a dependency injection uh, library by Uber. But you see, in ARM64, the symbol name is different. It says plus zero tramp zero appended to it. Now, why is that? What does it mean? They decided to check what is the assembly code for this symbol. As I said earlier, the symbols resolve to some addresses. So they go there and check that address in the executable file. We can see this is assembly to jump to a large letter address or jump and execute code from an address which is very far away from the current program counter. So what is this all about? Now finally, herein comes the difference between the architectures of ARM64 and AMD64. Look at this. The actual assembly, um, not the platform independent assembly, but the actual assembly instruction for ARM64 is called BL, which represents call. In ARM64, all instructions are 32-bit, which has 28 bits for the address of the function that we need to jump to. This is 28 bits of signed offset, which means that this offset value can be positive or negative. When this instruction is used, the processor adds this address value to the address of the instruction that it is currently processing or the current program counter and then jumps to the new address and executes whatever code is there. So for a negative address value, it would jump backward and for a positive address value, it would jump forward. Now look at this. It has only 28 bits to store that information. So it can jump forward or backward by two to the power 27 which means about 128 MBs. So what if the function that you want to call is more than 128 MB from the current location? What do you do then? In AMD64, this problem does not arise because in AMD64, the call instruction lets us give 40 bit address, which can represent up to plus minus two GB. So that's a lot of space that it can cover. So how is the problem on ARM64 solved? The answer is a trampoline a trampoline is inserted into the code. That is the symbol that we looked at earlier, the assembly code that we looked at earlier. Since the instruction, the call instruction or the BL instruction cannot reach the address directly, it instead points to the trampoline. It instead points to the trampoline symbol. And then from the trampoline, it goes to the real address. So it kind of takes a break in between to reach a longer distance. Now let's take a step back here. How is this difference in behavior breaking debugging? Let's take a look back at the Go linker. So before making it to the final executable, an object file must have generated by the compiler, which has the call instruction pointing to the symbol fx.new. Now when the linker is trying to read it, it realizes that that function is too far away and it cannot reach there. So it generates a trampoline and inserts it into the code. Not only it needs to change the address of the call uh, instruction, it also needs to change the details of the symbol that the instruction points to. So it was pointing to fx.new, it needs to point to fx.new plus tramp. So it needs to update the symbol itself. How does it do that? Till now, when that linker was reading an object file, it was reading an mapped version of it. Now, we don't really need to go into the depths of what is mmap. Think of it like this. It lets you read and write to a file like you are reading and writing from a memory. And the OS takes care of the rest. It takes care of actually manipulating the file. To change the symbol, to change the symbol from the object file, it cannot actually change it in the file. So what it does is it copies over the symbol into the memory and then changes things in it and then writes it back in the executable file. Now look at this code from Go's linker. When it's making that change, when it is updating that symbol, it is marking that symbol as external because it is copying it into the memory. Remember this, this would come in handy. Now let's finally 
talk about how the linker generates the dwarf information that we talked about that has the debugging information as we talked about that the debugging information is stored in the oxims or the auxiliary symbols so the linker goes over all the object files and reads the auxiliary symbols as well along with the symbol information now look at this code you will see that it skips loading aux symbols for any symbol that is marked as external because it assumes that that symbol will not have any auxiliary symbols associated with it if it's marked external but that is a wrong assumption that's what we saw the information for the symbol that has the trampoline was copied into the heap and marked external so the dwarf information for that or the debugging information for that symbol is not generated and thus uber's go debugging was failing so they did a classic one line change here and whenever this function comes and a symbol is marked as external they would just load the aux symbols from the heap instead of the m mapped content simple for just this one line change we got to learn so much about linkers about computer architectures and their differences and how go actually works so i'll say that is a pretty good deal from us and we got to learn these nifty little things from uber's incredible debugging experience well if you liked what i talked about leave a like on this video and make sure to go and read the full article which i will link in the description uh, to know more about their debugging journey the article where i have made this video on and do share this video with your friends do share this video on linkedin on somewhere i don't know make sure i get more eyeballs guys do that all right leaving you for now see you in the next video